Right then, welcome back to another Amiga vid. This one is for Silkworm. I'm going to let the intro play out as I always do. It does last a couple of minutes, or just over. So as soon as that has finished, I'll crack on with some gameplay and a little bit of commentary. So yeah, not bad music, I guess, for uh, for 1989. And I tell you what, as an Amstrad owner back in 1989, that intro and that music and that bass line would have absolutely blown my socks off because it wasn't really till the following year that I really got into 16-bit computers. Initially, it would have been at my friend's house with the Amiga and the ST, and then I got the ST myself, and then eventually got the Amiga and so on and so forth. But the Amstrad, absolutely lovely. But anyway, I don't know why I started talking about the Amstrad there. Um, I guess I could mention the Amstrad and say that this also came out on the Amstrad, the Commodore 64 and the Spectrum, apart from obviously the Amiga and the ST. And by all accounts, the Amiga version is the uh, is the best version. It's uh, like a true to an arcade port as they come, closely followed by the Atari ST. Now, what I did here is that the Amiga version, even though it's pretty much a replica of the arcade, it does feature a couple of extra enemies, although what enemies they are, I'm not certain. I have played the arcade version, but we're going back a long, long time, uh, a good 20 odd years uh, at the very least. So yeah, that's that. So as you can see, I'm controlling the helicopter. Now, really, this is the kind of game back in the day that would have been great. In fact, I did play it back in the day two player, but it is that kind of game where if you've got a friend playing in the same room, very old school, none of this online caper, even though that is good. But yeah, um, back in the day, two people in the same room, one on joystick or one on key, two on keys, whatever, and um, and both having fun on the same game at the same time. But the reason why I'm controlling the helicopter and not the Jeep, which is the option for player two, is that the Jeep is really difficult to control. And it's not something I've just, you know, uh, re-familiarised myself with. I remember back in the day it being rock hard, and every time I ever played this game with a friend, I never wanted to be the Jeep. None of us did, because it was rubbish. You can jump uh, as you're going along, which helps to jump over the enemies and the bullets and all of the rest of it and you do have a 180 degree uh, turret which is adjustable and that helps as well but it's really hard because you are restricted to the bottom of the screen whereas as you can see when you're in the uh, in the chopper you've got 90 percent pretty much 80 90 percent of the screen to roam around and so it's much freer you know you're in control whereas like i say with the jeep it's difficult because it's restricted 
and in fact just to highlight how difficult it can be to control the jeep or i guess to highlight how badly i did at controlling it i'll add a couple of minutes of gameplay at the end of this vid of me just solely controlling the jeep i say solely i mean the helicopter's also on screen at the same time but i'm using the jeep and I do particularly uh, atrocious at it, but uh, at least it'll give you a picture if you weren't already familiar with, with how it works. Now that's annoying there, because I picked up an icon which would have given me rapid fire, and then within seconds of getting it, I just wasn't concentrating, and went straight into uh, an enemy aircraft, so I instantly lost it. So yeah, that's one of the icons that you can pick up. Another couple of the icons that you can get are invincibility, and that will last around about 10 seconds, I reckon. We'll probably see it again, well, quite a few times, actually, because it is common throughout the level, uh, and each level at that. And once you, you'll see it in a second, it's basically like a swarm of stars, and it uh, kind of hovers around, uh, circulates around the helicopter, or jeep, whatever you're controlling. And so if anything uh, goes into you, be it uh, an enemy helicopter, or here it is, uh, bullets, or whatever it is, you're protected. Now, if you've got this invincibility currently on and you pick up another invincibility icon, then it causes a smart bomb to detonate and it'll destroy everything on the level. So a pretty common feature. I think quite frankly that's been in the previous two games that I've done as well. So uh, Leander and Warzone. I think most games, you know, which were kind of involving platforms and shooters, uh, they had that kind of feature. So that's nothing new, but it definitely helps because it can get tricky. Now, I think this is the third level I'm about to start. Uh, with like kind of a reddish sky. Yeah, there we are. Um, it's like taking place in the Grand Canyon or wherever. I have no idea. But um, but yeah, so it's been pretty straightforward so far, but it does get hectic. In fact, there's that smart bomb I was talking about, and it really helps. And, you know, when you've got the invincibility on, there's no real point shooting things. You might as well just go into it and automatically uh, destroy it that way, by default, if you like. There's another smart bomb. I'm taking the easy route here. So yeah, one of the things you may have noticed as well is that the enemies on screen, are, they are a little bit different from level to level, but they all kind of do the same thing. So it's just an aesthetic thing. You know, they don't offer anything particularly new. You're going to get your helicopters, your enemy ships, whatever it is flying through the air. You're going to get your turrets like this on the ground. If it doesn't look like that, then it'll be that kind of orange slice or <laughs> whatever it was from the previous level. So it's nothing particularly new in that sense, but the game does get more hectic. Uh, as the game progresses without question. I mean, look at that. How did I get out of that? There's them orange slices. See? I'm sure they're not really orange slices, but they certainly look like it. So, yeah, I think to surmise, I'd say that I really like it, and it's been great going back to Silkworm for the first time in many a year. Now, it is worth pointing out, if it wasn't already aesthetically obvious, that, you know, 1989 was still within the infancy of the 16-bit era, so it doesn't really look too earth-shatteringly amazing in comparison to an 8-bit game. Not really. So, uh, yeah, I mean, for me, 1990, I guess, is when it really started uh, to look the part. And it, to me, it was like, right, I've got to get a 16-bit system. Before 1990, I was happy with the Amstrad, and I didn't really want to move on. I didn't really have an incentive. But it was really, this was kind of the turning point. Not this game, but this kind of era. So it doesn't look particularly fresh. It doesn't look really 16-bit in my eyes. But it is a good game, and it is very nostalgic. Now, I will also add as well, for anyone thinking of buying this, just be wary of what you pay, because I'm looking right now on ebay.co.uk, and you probably know what I'm going to say, but there's three copies on there, and the cheapest is 30 quid, and you would be a mug if you paid that, because it's not worth it. Unless you've got money to burn, and money's no object, just hold fire and wait until one's relisted, or sorry, one's listed, I should say, with a starting price of, say, 99 pence, because it is the kind of game that could get an eventual final price uh, of, say, three, four, five quid, you know, with everyone bidding on it. So don't be lulled into a false sense of security thinking it's worth 30 quid because there's only three on eBay. It isn't. So just bide your time if I were you. That's, that's my little tip there, unless you've just got money to burn. And if you have, you can give me 30 quid for my copy, uh, if you want. <laughs> I'll sign it for you, and I'll probably devalue, of course, but... Uh, I'm joking. No, I'm obviously not going to sell mine. I bought it back because I want it. But yeah, so just be uh, joking aside, just um, just be wary for that. And maybe if you see it for a fiver or you see it for a tenner, yeah, pick it up. But don't start going higher than that because it really isn't worth it. Uh, you know what eBay's like. Anyway, so coming towards the end of the vid, I very quickly control the Jeep here. Uh, and very badly control the Jeep. So as you can see, you're restricted to the bottom of the screen. You can jump. You can also move forward like uh, an accelerator button. But I didn't use it once in this gameplay, which doesn't help. 
and the accelerator really helps for obviously when you've got the homing missiles coming down and you can get out of the way from them. So, but either way, even with that feature when you're using it, it's still really hard. It's such a difficult game to control with a Jeep. But even though it is difficult to control, it's still nice that it's there. And I, once again, you know, Roast Tinted Glasses just reminds me of a time when, you know, you'd have your mates in the same room as you playing on the same system, one with the zip stick or whatever joystick you had, the Python was another one uh, me and my friends had. Or whether it was just on keyboard or whatever it was, it was just a great time. And yeah, you know, obviously multiplayer online these days is all very well. It works and I do like it. I know it's not for everyone, but there's something special, you know, about back in the day playing, you know, 8-bit and 16-bit systems of having two of your mates or just one of your mates in the room playing uh, the same game at the same time as you. But anyway, I'm reminiscing too much there. So thanks for watching. I'll be back with more videos soon, uh, more Amiga vids, more a bit of everything that you've probably come to expect from my channel. Thanks for watching. See you later.